Hi folks, uh, welcome to class 7 of public administration theory. Should government be run like a business? Now, uh, in this session we will uh, cover some of the key ideas that uh, I introduced in last class, which is essentially the idea of new public management way of thinking. And uh, really appreciate this idea uh, since it is important but also critique it in the sense that really look at it from the perspective of uh, service to people. Now, does this take into consideration notions of uh, service to uh, the people who are involved, that is citizens in a country, uh, and also look at how a purely economic uh, valuation of uh, services through efficiency and accountability, how they can be limiting in many ways while they are important, uh, critics of new public management argue that it's uh, important to look at how purely reducing everything to money or reducing uh, all aspects of governance to uh, efficiency is not a terribly good idea. So we'll, we'll examine both perspectives and uh, the dominant mod model or perspective as you may be aware is the one of new public management, which is to say that government has to be run like a business and in the current administration we're seeing more and more of that but this is not uh, in any way a new development this has been going on since the 1980s so this is what we're seeing today is just one of the extremes of that particular way of thinking so uh, as again as I have probably said earlier uh, the real felt need for this uh, way of thinking is that a government has become very bloated it has become very large in the sense that the spending has uh, gone out of hand and uh, this has coincided with uh, a push for greater effectiveness and also a demand for better management of government services and government uh, way of doing things which is fair to a large extent you know there are aspects of certain programs and services which are which can be uh, streamlined and made better However, the logics that are used to justify this uh, can, can be looked at from various perspectives. And uh, as again, many scholars have pointed out, uh, this move has come about, uh, you know, really since 1920s or 1930s, you could say. So move from a very industrial age to an information age. And uh, also it reached a peak, you could say, starting around Reagan onwards, 1980s and onwards. Uh, with the rise of what I described earlier as the Chicago School of uh, Economists, Milton Friedman, and people who really push for uh, free market ideas and uh, classical liberalism really taking hold uh, in the dominant in, and becoming really the dominant way of thinking uh, among policymakers. And uh, this has led to, uh, as we have said and discussed earlier, a reduction in the welfare state and increased uh, privatization and devolution of services from the state to uh, you know private contractors and even to communities in some sense so i'd like you to watch this uh, video uh, an interview with david osborne who's really one of the seminal thinkers in this area and his book reinventing government really is in a way considered almost a bible of people who want to talk about uh, reducing uh, the role of government in, in the public sphere so pause this video for a second and watch this interview with Osborne and then you can get back to this particular PowerPoint and my video. Uh, welcome back and uh, as I said earlier, uh, new public management has uh, really, it, it, the first real experiment was in New Zealand uh, with you know the government, federal government, they're implementing a lot of the reforms uh, and other countries really picking it up and running with it uh, as they say. Uh, and uh, this coincided with a lot of changes uh, in broader e economy and social and political thinking as well. And the next video uh, by Kelsey, which is actually a reading of Joseph Nye's uh, uh, arguments on, of the ushering of the information technology age, is, is actually put things in a certain context and helps you understand how globalization, marketization and the information revolution have really contributed to this this but important uh, shift in in the way we think about government and its role in our society so again pause this video for a few uh, minutes and watch Kelsey's presentation uh, we'll get back to our presentation after that 
Now, uh, the the real uh, critique or uh, rather the way of thinking about this, at least the way that I think about these issues is to think of, okay, how how good is it? How bad is it? Or how ugly can it get? And now, uh, again, I, I, I'm still divided on this issue. I don't have a clear cut ideological answer. I don't think government should be run like a business always, but there is a case to be made when certain aspects of government administration can be streamlined, can be made efficient. Uh, for instance, take uh, the case of, uh, you know, uh, growing up in India, applying for a passport was a huge, huge deal in the sense that it took you almost eight months to a year uh, from the moment you applied for your passport to get it. Now, uh, when I got my first passport, when I was 20 years old, uh, they had already started streamlining the process and the process was really reduced because the use of a lot of technology, they brought it down to about two and a half or three months. So things like that, service delivery where large numbers of people are involved, there is a need for greater efficiencies, greater sort of focus on uh, aspects which will improve the performance. Uh, and uh, the ultimate real uh, test of any, any policy, I would say, is how much does it protect human dignity? How much does it promote trust among people? How much does it really serve people versus uh, you know, other interests, whether it be a group of people, a smaller group of people, whether it be businessmen, whether it be uh, anyone else who it is not intended to serve? And uh, I think that's really the test of any policy. Whether uh, if it does a good job of serving people, even if it is through um, making it a business, uh, through you know using business methodologies, I think it's a fair fair game as far as I'm concerned. However, you cannot put economic value on democratic participation, equity, and justice, and these issues which you know people could say are non-monetary. So you can't you know quantify justice, right? You can't quantify uh, equality or participation. Uh, and uh, even the whole notion of fair chance for everybody. So if you are bypassing these and saying, okay, in the spirit of efficiency, let's get things done and leave out a bunch of people who are important stakeholders in any, in any process, you're not doing justice to them or you're not behaving as a responsible government uh, agent uh, to that effect. So that's, that's my two cents on these issues. Uh, this is a short, quick video, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I also hope you enjoyed the other readings. I will uh, look forward to meeting you guys when I'm back, but in the meanwhile, uh, please keep up with the readings, and uh, I might send you uh, some additional readings uh, when I find some time or if I come across something interesting. But uh, as long as you've covered the required readings and if you have the interest and inclination to also look at the recommended ones, I think uh, you'll be good to go. I have some basis, some additional resources here for you. Uh, so enjoy your your time and hope to see you all soon. Thank you.